always a privilege to uh, address your students. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation and uh, thanks a lot with your ma'am for having me here twice. Um, and, and to the students of uh, CMR, I should actually say, now this being the second time that I'm addressing um, the batch of CMR, it's, it's, it's kind of double jeopardy that you're being prosecuted and punished twice, uh, uh, probably for the same offense or not. Yeah, okay, now um, that was in another context. I had addressed, I'm not really sure as to whether it was the same set of students, but uh, I, think, I think my presentation was on privacy in the cyberspace as regards whether it's a myth or it's for real. Today, I'm, I'm uh, uh, presenting on an entirely different uh, concept and context on, on medical law and ethics. Now, I think I've got the point, and probably you could you could probably understand the way in which my presentation is going to go. Laws regarding abortion, that's called as medical termination of pregnancy. Do you see a word abortion there? Do you actually see the word, the nomenclature abortion being used in the laws related to abortion? If not, why? Probably, probably, okay. To some, uh, this it would be in this context that I would be trying to kind of speak for for an hour or more, right? So probably my intention is to kind of throw open so much and so much of you know critical questions in the area of healthcare. Now I would be focusing on both medical law as well as health health law in the con as well as health in the context of my discussion. But let's try to kind of reach one particular consensus. And my statement that I'm going to make obviously do come with so much and so much of exceptions. I'm aware of that, but still, like I said, there's no point drawing parallel lines at the same time. It should converge at some particular point, right? So there's no point arguing on law and morality all the time. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to kind of, trying to enter into a consensus by ensuring the fact that at least for this presentation, can we understand law as the enforceable part of ethics and ethics as the unenforceable part of law. If it's really possible for all of us to kind of understand it this way, that whenever I use the term law, I intend to use law as a term, meaning the enforceable part of ethics, because there's so much and so much uh, uh, of areas of conflict, especially in the area of, of medical ethics. So what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to kind of give you certain questions trying to confuse you as much as i can probably in the context probably in the space of this one to kind of start with one one kind of confusion that exists in the context of law and ethics in healthcare or legal and ethical issues in healthcare would it be really really easy for for all of you to kind of give me a straight specific answer to the question that I'm going to ask. It's, it's a very rhetorical question. So I do not kind of specifically, you know, look out for a particular answer, right? It's kind of a rhetorical question, but if you are permitted to answer, you may. And the question is this, what is that you prefer? Do you prefer a right of the unborn child to be born out of the mother's womb? Or do you prefer the individual, independent, female, reproductive right to abort? So the mother saying that she's got this right to abort, whether that should prevail over the right of the unborn child not to get aborted, but to be born out of the mother's womb. Is this question really easy to answer? You might give me your opinions when it comes to framing your supporting arguments on law, again, that could be easier because you could always establish the fact that this is the law of medical termination of pregnancy, though it does not use the term abortion. Uh, it, 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 gives us, it gives us certain rights, certain provisions within a period of 20 weeks, within a period of 24 weeks, even if it crosses 24 weeks with the help of, with the opinion of uh, one registered medical practitioner in certain cases, two registered medical practitioners in certain cases, with the, with the recommendation of the medical board in almost all the other cases. You could, you could frame your argument supporting on the basis of the provisions that exist in the MPPA. But if you try to argue on ethics, that may not reach anywhere. Now, I used the same term for both these concepts, right of the unborn child, right of the mother to abort. So as long as I continue to use rights of the mother as well as of the child, then I don't think that we can ever enter into a conclusion 
both could prevail both could prevail but that's 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 a myth you can't just have both the rights to prevail at the same time especially if it if it comes into conflict to each other so i think the safest way one of the safest ways is to classify one as a right and the other one as a liberty i i hope it makes sense now again again it it's not like an absolute perfect answer but one of the possibilities is to kind of classify one as a right and the other one as a liberty how do you do that one of the philosophers have actually said if my if my action if my act depends on another person's act say for example if my act depends on another person's act then it is a right okay if my act does not depend on another person's act then it's a liberty so i am not trying to give you my subjective opinion on abortion i might be a person who favors abortion but philosophically when you put it an unborn child's act obviously depend on obviously depends on the mother's act not to abort so that becomes a right the mother to decide whether to abort or not that's her choice she should not even ask her husband right that's her choice provided in the indian law if she doesn't ask her husband and then go for abortion that's considered as cruelty and that's a ground for divorce but technically speaking as per the mpp act and as per the judicial interpretations it's her right you require only one person's consent and that's the mother's consent but that becomes a liberty according to this particular law so i'm just trying to give you an idea as to how complex this this area is with respect to what i said right now people who favor abortion they would completely oppose what i said right now how can mothers right to abort only be a liberty which should actually succumb to the unborn child's right to be born this like agree to that i don't have an option i can't i can't uh, criticize your argument further because what you say is right now when what i'm going to discuss right now are concepts related to what i said right now probably an unborn child's right to live concepts associated with medical negligence concepts associated with informed consent concepts associated with death when can you call a particular person dead should should the brain stop working should the heart stop working there is should, should there be a cardiac arrest people lying in coma are they dead if there is no chance for survival or if there is no chance for revival after like 15 or 20 years what what exactly are the scenario concerning legal death so i'm i'm trying to kind of give you some ideas and more than ideas when i realized the fact that i have satisfactorily confused all of you probably that's the time when i stop this presentation but it may not go beyond an hour or so so my aim is to confuse you more so one such confusion is this unborn child's right to live or mother's right to abort probably if we have some time for discussions we may take this up again even if you look at the way in which probably health law or medical law evolved both these things are different but i'm just using it as a synonym for this presentation ban to use contraceptives was considered as violative of 14th amendment way back in 1965 itself in the us a landmark decision in the nine in the year 1973 roe versus wade right to abort as part of the mother's individual reproductive right my body my autonomy my right i would decide what i should be doing with my body but the the issues don't stop there the issues don't stop there one of the basic issues connected with medical law or rather there are several issues i'll tell you if you are a patient going to a doctor what is that you want you want the doctor to take care of you you want to ensure the fact that obviously you want to ensure the fact that the doctor doesn't do any mess up and then create some bodily injury on you right so you you you're placing the entire trust on that particular doctor at the same time who should be taking decisions when it comes to administering a medicine on you or when it when it is a surgery on your body who should be taking the decision patients or the doctors this discussion could be fruitful but the problem is we have got an other entity inter interfering here you just don't have patients taking care of decisions on that for themselves you don't have doctors taking care of decisions for the patients you have judges interfering and then taking care of the uh, decisions deciding for the patients as well as the doctors that's 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 what we are going to analyze and that towards the latter part of the discussion so can the judges have a right to interfere in medical ethics are they qualified are they knowledgeable in that area 
can they say what the doctor say is not correct can they say what the patient say is not correct we will see all those areas but just just to give you an idea regarding the law behind this roe versus wade is not just a landmark decision in the case of abortion we have got plenty of other decisions also what roe versus wade did was they they kind of you know divided the entire term of pregnancy into three first trimester second trimester and the third trimester they said in the first trimester you have absolute right to do whatever you want with the baby if you want abort you abort if you want to carry along with the pregnancy you do it the state cannot interfere in the second trimester they the government could interfere to a minimum level the third trimester the government interference is maximum this is what roe versus wade said but what you should understand is the 1973 law which we still consider as landmark changed in the year 1992 and in the year 1992 planned parenthood case what happened was technology has advanced technology has advanced so during roe versus wade whether a baby whether a child is viable or not could only be understood when you reach the 28th week 1992 the court said no no by around 24th week itself we'll understand whether the child is viable or not from so from the 24th week itself the state could interfere so you actually see someone else taking decisions for you either it could be judges either it could be doctors or either it could be the state till 20 weeks you could abort with the opinion of a registered medical practitioner till 24 weeks you could abort after the latest amendment till 24 weeks you could abort but with the with the opinion of two registered medical practitioners over and about 24 weeks the medical board will take a decision even otherwise even before the amendment even before the amendment the judiciary used to constitute medical board for each and every cases minors right to abort medical board being constituted whether the minors consent is an informed consent does she aware so every time we are talking about our own bodily rights under medical law under medical ethics but someone else would decide that for you is that right or wrong is something that we need to understand look at the defenses that is available to the doctor under ipc we are placing our entire trust on that particular doctor are we still willing to take these risks doctor by way of an accident in doing a surgery commits an error doctor is not liable criminally liable maybe civil liable section 88 ipc act done in good faith not intended to cause death but causes death doctor is not liable so we have these excuses and justifications under the ipc supporting the other party what are the options that we have as a patient you look at this i'm i'm, I'm i think this this particular uh, uh, image is is visible uh, legible to all of you are you able to read it something that was reported in june uh, something that was reported on june 16th 2021 last last year mid of last year and i was really really surprised and kind of shocked to see this particular news doctor getting one year imprisonment that's not something that we have heard in the context of medical negligence what actually happened was a trial judge in kerala he gave he or she gave an imprisonment of one year to a doctor who prolonged the delivery of an expected mother because of which the child died after after a couple of days see look at it one year imprisonment for a doctor because of medical negligence this is actually the correct position of law but but unfortunately our supreme court judgments as well as the interpretations go against this and i am pretty much sure that you are aware of that so i'm not going to deal with that much but still just to understand just to make you understand what what is ipc what does ipc talk about our 304a it says whoever causes death by doing a rash or negligent act the word that is used is or not and if you commit death by a negligent act or if you commit death by a rash act what do you mean by rash here reckless reckless so the higher amount of negligence is recklessness gross negligence so whether it is gross negligence or mere negligence you have to suffer criminal liability that is what is being specifically stated under 304a but if you actually look at the interpretations and the judgments given by the indian supreme court there is a problem let's look at suresh gupta versus government of nct of delhi 2004 look at what the court has said when a patient agrees for a medical treatment 
every careless act of the medical man cannot be termed as criminal look at that every act cannot be termed as criminal that is what they say which means what to make doctors liable to make doctors criminally liable mere negligence is not enough gross negligence is enough irrespective of whether it is a gross negligence or negligence 304a ask you to actually fix criminal liability on everybody why are doctors given an exception yes you have got jacob matthews case explaining that further another decision it says when the doctor goes in for a surgery if he thinks that something bad happens he is going to be put behind the bars his hands would shiver exact terminology being used his hands would shiver because of which we are not fixing criminal liability on the doctors in case of medical negligence negligence should be that gross only then criminal liability would be fixed what all are the cases coming under gross negligence we don't know amputing the left leg instead of the right leg rodents eating the dead bodies kept in the mortuary fixing to switch uh, failing to switch on the tube for oxygen supply thereby causing the death of a person all these are not none of these are gross negligence these are only negligence for which exemplary amount of compensation could be given by the doctors as well as the hospitals but but not fixing criminal liability this is what the attitude of the supreme court is how can we patients submit ourselves before the 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 uh, 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 doctors and the judiciary in certain cases i'll tell you what has resulted in all these cases what resulted in all these cases is this olam versus fryan hospital manage these are all you know uh, spoken uh, uh, in almost all the textbooks people people uh, in this in the eighth semester the final semesters and all those you know we see know this but i'm trying to give an additional point also to this whether a doctor is negligent or not you do, you will not ask an academician right you will not ask a you will not ask an advocate whether a doctor is negligent or not you wouldn't ask any other ordinary man on the street you wouldn't ask a man on a clay pam omnibus you wouldn't ask any other reasonable man what do you do bolams test said in 1957 bolams test said if the judges want to know whether a doctor has been in fact negligent or not based on the facts they should ask similarly placed skilled medical professionals so if doctor a is liable or not for negligence for knowing that the the, the judge should ask another panel of doctors b c and d to know whether this particular doctor was in fact negligent or not there are two issues there the judges need not ask the doctors with the highest amount of skill no the the expected reasonable amount of skilled doctors that's enough that's enough what would those doctors say those doctors would obviously protecting their brother right they say that in this is also an accepted procedure we do this also so you don't have to uh, no whenever the nurse calls the doctor it is not mandatory for the doctor to uh, attend the patient this is the procedure that follow then that doc- particular doctor has committed that it is not negligent problem solved that is what bolam's test said if you look at the if you look at the facts of bolam you would be surprised to know how can the particular judiciary come out with this particular bolam's test you know what happened in that particular judgment a particular person had some mental problems mental issues so he had to give that electroconvulsive therapy and give that electric shock so basically before giving electric shock what we do is we give that particular patient some kind of relaxant muscle relaxant so that his, his bones wouldn't break and all and he would his body would be restrained also there will be three four persons restraining his movement this was not done these two things were not done he was given that kind of a therapy electric shock because of which his bone fractured and and the dog the judges asked another panel of doctors they said in some cases we don't do all these things so you cannot actually uh, uh, hold that particular doctor guilty of medical negligence and they adopted this particular test what is that test the test is to know whether a doctor is negligent or not you ask another panel of doctors who are similarly placed and similarly skilled not the highest amount of skill not an ordinary man but this has created a lot of problems first problem is this if you are a patient and i am a doctor who was negligent i would be getting an opinion from one particular panel of doctors who would say that i am not negligent as a victim you would go for another panel of doctors who would actually say that yes that is medical negligence so there will be a conflicting decisions whenever there has been conflicting decisions before the indian supreme court supreme indian supreme court have favored supreme indian supreme court has favored the opinion given by the doctors the panel of doctors 
who had supported that particular doctor was otherwise negligent or not. That's the problem with regard to Bolanskis. 1957. And what happened? By around 1996, judges in the United Kingdom understood the fact that each and every decision cannot be decided, each and every decision cannot be taken up by the doctors. There are cases where we don't have to admit whatever the doctors say. We could also come to a reasonable conclusion. Say, for example, there could be technical decisions, non-technical decisions. Technical decisions, let the doctors say, we'll approve. Non-technical decisions, we would, we would say, say, for example, before transplantation of human organs and tissues, you take the consent of a particular person if he's living, if he's a living donor. If he's dead, you take the permission of the next kin. If you don't do that, the judges are very well qualified to understand informed consent is not taken. And hence, that particular set of doctors or physicians are liable for medical negligence. Gross negligence or not, that's a different question. But Bolam's test has been replaced to a very great extent by Bolito's test, which we may not see in most of the books. Bolito's test. Now, the problem is what? If you look at the Indian decisions, the Indian decisions have actually used both the tests. We are confused. Our courts are confused whether to go for Bolam's test or whether to go for Bolito's test. What is Bolam's test? If a doctor is negligent, ask other panel of doctors, they would say they are not negligent. Admitted, the doctors are not negligent. What is Bolito's test? Just because another panel of doctors say this particular doctor is not negligent doesn't mean that we, the judges cannot come to a different conclusion. We would decide whether this particular doctor is negligent or not. So in the year 2009 itself, in the same year, you could see Supreme Court relying on Bolam's test in one case as well as in another case, Bolito's. So even now, even in 2022, we don't have that kind of a clarity as to in which all cases they would rely on Bolito, in which all cases they would rely on Bolam. And it's really, really important. It's really important. I'll tell you why it is important. Let's look at 1981 decision. There was a baby... Soon after the baby was born, Arthur's case, the baby was rejected by the mother because first of all, the baby had Down syndrome and several other abnormalities as well. So there was just little probabilities for the uh, baby to survive. So it was, it was interested with the doctor, with the hospital. You know what the doctor did? The doctor did not provide the baby food, but the doctor provided water and the doctor also provided a sedative to the baby so that the baby wouldn't ask for nutrition or food, right? After two days, the baby died and the cause of death was linked to the Down syndrome. So the doctor was tried for attempted murder because the, the doctor did not provide him food. Now here, 1981, here the jury decided that the doctor is not guilty for attempted murder and they evolved a particular principle. What is that principle? It is an accepted practice not to give proper treatment but to prescribe nursing care only, which means you do that mere enough things so that the baby may not survive for long but die quickly. That's, that's, that's really possible according to the law evolved through the 1981 decision. You know what the meaning is? The meaning of this decision is if you are a patient and you want a particular painkiller to alleviate a decade long pain or something, you go to the doctor, you go to the physician, he is legally entitled to prescribe that kind of a painkiller, even though he as well as the patient know that that's, that would alleviate the pain, but that would speed the process of death. So you might leave for another like 10 years, but because of this particular painkiller being used by you for like consecutive years, you might die in another seven or eight years. Not, not you wouldn't leave for like seven, ten years. So the problem is, this is what the law is. 1981, this was what the law. The doctor will not be punished for attempt to murder. But look at the ethical part. What the doctor did. Can we say that the doctor was acting in the best interest of the child? Can we say that? Now, this acting in the best interest of the child. You look at any state, any legislations related to children. You look at convention related to child, you would see this thing acting in the best interest of the child is required. Can we actually say killing that particular child was in fact the best interest of the child? Who would solve these issues? Who would even argue on these issues? Who would solve these particular issues? I look at one particular example with regard to medical negligence and I think I'll move on to another area. The surgery is successful but the doctor cannot trace certain surgical equipments and the mops and the towels used. That's to inside the patient's body. 
don't you actually think there's medical negligence there? It's stressed as shit. There's medical negligence. Can't we also understand the fact there's gross amount of medical negligence there? Stitching a towel inside the patient's body, scissor inside a patient, gross amount of medical negligence. Naturally, logically. So there were cases in India. If I if I if I can just give you that particular cost title, nineteen ninety six, a Chitrauz case. They said. Reception locator could be applicable in cases of medical negligence. What do you mean by reception locator? You don't have to actually go for too much or too much of plenty arguments that usually happens in the Indian courts. Looking at the facts, the facts speak for itself. The things speak for itself. If you have the towel inside the patient's body, that amounts to medical negligence. Reception locator that's applicable. That's what 1996. That's a Supreme Court said. What happened was 2005. After nine years, when Bolland's test was applied in Jacob Matthews' case, they said reception locator could only guide cases on torts and civil law. Reception locator cannot be applied for fixing criminal liability. So, if the more pustis inside the patient body, you are not talking about reception locator for the purpose of fixing criminal liability. For fixing civil liability, you could use that. Maybe it's law. I'm not disputing the law, but look at the sad position of the patients there. And the unfortunate situation is that we still don't know if a case come up in 2023 whether Bolland's test would be applied or Bolito's test would be applied. That much of problems are associated with this particular sphere of law. And now everybody talks about informed consent. I'm pretty much sure that you also might have read a lot when you might have worked for examinations or moot courts or presentations. Informed consent, informed consent all the time. Uh, maybe a bit surprising to notice the fact that. it should have actually been termed as real consent in india and not informed consent because there are two versions of the consent real consent which we follow in uk informed consent which we follow in us so what do you mean by a real consent so when you talk about real consent you are focusing on the patient whether the patient knew the procedure whether the patient was knew about the side effects whether the patient gave the consent voluntarily whether the patient had the capacity and competency to do it it you are focusing on the patient just like the indian way real consent us they say whether the doctors disclose the entire information so more, real consent in uk and india is more like the patient's right or or it's it's whether the patient knew everything you are focusing on the patient real consent informed consent in america is basically like rather than the right of a patient it's basically like a duty cast on the doctors to kind of inform everything did you inform so you're asking the doctors you're not asking the patients so it's the same the effect is the same practical effect is the same but there's been a misnomer in the indian context it should have been real consent because we follow real consent in the indian context but you look at any legislations they don't in india they don't use the term real consent they use informed consent which is the problem now when i say informed consent please don't be you know mistaken there why because it's not like in every case there could be something called as a proper informed consent there could be various forms of consent say for example there could be something called as i i have that also there could be something called as you know an implied consent there could be something called as expressed consent there could be something called as tacit consent there could be something called as embodied consent what do you mean by an implied consent implied consent is something where say you go to the dentist right or you go with a mild fever do you have any doctor explaining to you the entire procedures and then taking down your consent in explicit form in a document and then trying to treat you no the fact that you go and then use use the particular chair kept there means that you have consented make sure that that's implied consent there's something called as explicit consent then there's something called as tacit consent wherein it's really complicated but you don't have more case laws there but it's kind of the failure of the patient to kind of disagree or dissent so the patient says that you know i i supposedly have consented but i kind of failed to kind of disagree on for the procedure so i i was like frozen that's tacit consent so the, the the based on the the based on the uh the way in which the patient behaves the doctors would think that there's this tax that consent already given it's just that the patient has not disagreed and we cannot get we cannot ascertain that then there's certain thing called as embodied consent you might have heard about you know chiropractors and all that say for example what they do is uh when they they when they when they do that particular bodily procedure like say for example a therapeutic massage or whatever when they do that particular procedure they should be able to understand the fact that the body language of the patients say that they're not really comfortable with the group. that moment they should stop that's called as embodied consent consent that is evident from the body language so there are a lot of consents that are there which one would be applicable dep- depends on the context making matters worse there is another concept 
called as therapeutic privilege. And the simplest example I'll tell you: you go to the doctor. That shouldn't happen to you. God forbid. But the, 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 you go to the doctor. The doctor performs certain tests on you, and then the doctor understands the fact that you are suffering from a deadly disease, maybe a blood cancer, and you could actually live for another three years. Now, should the doctor be disclosing that information straight away to the patient? Are yeah, you are suffering from blood cancer or something? Okay, can the doctor say that? Now the problem is you got arguments on both the sides all the time. That's a problem with this kind of an area. Therapeutic privilege is that privilege that allows the physicians or the doctors to withhold certain information if they think that adverse reaction could be expected from the patient. So you don't put it straight away to the patient that you're going to die in another two years because the patient might die within a day after heart attack also on hearing that. But persons who criticize this uh, therapeutic privilege actually say that's a paternalistic attitude of the doctors. They would decide what should be disclosed to the patient or not. Makes no sense. But there's another side to that as well. So there, I've given they have given a few links. If if you require, you may just copy it now, right now, or I might paste in the chat box. One of the links actually disclose what a doctor experienced. A patient went to the particular doctor. She was a dermatologist, meaning she used to take care of skin uh, ailments. and he said can't you actually see there are worms on my body like worms on my body was like what see can can't you see on my palms and face and and all everywhere that the 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 worms eating my body part by part i've been suffering this thing for the past two and a half years and she was kind of continuously itching and scratching on her body and the doctor said yes i could see that and she says the patient says if you tell me that just by mental delusion i'm going to be really mad at you admit the fact that i have is because i've seen lot of other doctors they did not admit you know what actually happened the particular patient did not have any problem on her skin the only problem was on her mind she had a mental delusion that she was suffering from this kind of a problem you know what the doctor did the doctor did say that okay i am suggesting you to actually you know uh, use several creams but it's also suggested that you go to a psychiatrist it is also suggested that you go to a Psychiatrists. So therapeutic privilege works in certain cases. She, the patient, wasn't disclosed that it was a mental problem, right? She was, she wasn't told that she did not have any physical problem. But along with using therapeutic privilege, she could, she could guide that particular patient towards the psychiatrist. So use of therapeutic privilege is also valid. We don't have any kind of, you know, good documents regarding that. But, but I just said that these could be possible areas of conflict. the reason why we do have to know about informed consent or any form of consent i can explain that with the help of two 2002 decisions look at this particular decision miss b versus nhs hospital trust so the particular patient look at the look at the scaffold the patient was completely paralyzed but she could just slightly you know uh, nod her head and then she could speak so she said so th this was not the first time she was paralyzed after the first paralysis when she recovered she had written a will saying that next time if i if i if i get paralyzed and then if i am put on a, a, a an artificial you know ventilator then that ventilator should be turned off i should be withdrawn the the, the particular support should be withdrawn from uh, my body and i should be allowed to die so she had written a living will now initially the doctor said she she has lost the mental capacity to decide whether she should die or not when the matter reached the court the court said yes if the mental capacity is not an issue if she knows for sure that she is going to die if the support system has been withdrawn then let her die 2002 that was allowed by the uk courts on the same day an another petition was filed but not in the uk courts but in the echr european court of human rights that that case is this that case is uh, pretty was dying pretty versus uk what basically happened was she there's a very famous statement of her she says i want to have a quick death without suffering at home surrounded by my family her argument was slightly different she said that her husband should not be given any kind of criminal liability if her husband supports in her death the court said nothing is not allowed your husband would be given criminal liability if he assists you in your death same day 2002 same year one decision consent was admitted death was given as you know whatever she she had asked for that was that was granted on on another case echr says no those kind of consent is not valid 
Now, consent from an adult person, you could actually see conflicting decisions there. I'm not going into Australia, Canada decisions and all that. I have it in my school, but let's let's probably, if, if, it, if there is time towards the end, we'll deal with that. So I do have a question to all of you here. Can medical decisions be taken by the patients alone? Can medical decisions be taken by the doctors alone? Can medical decisions be taken by the judges who may not have a keen idea on this, relying on the opinions given by other set of doctors? Say, for example, a severely disabled child inside the mother's womb. Should that baby live or not? Who takes the decision? Who takes the decision? Right? So can every decision be taken by the doctors alone? Let me just take you to another area which is something connected to death. When can you actually say that a person is dead? I'm not going into the typical discussions on uh, euthanasia, Aruna Shabag, or suicide tourism. By the way, as an information, don't ever think of this, but as an information, the best place to die is Switzerland. Why? Because there's something called as suicide tourism, and most of the Germans go there. Um, have you heard about physician-assisted suicide? I think it's important for all of you to know that also in this context. There's something called as physician-assisted suicide. It is not passive euthanasia. It is not active euthanasia. It's different from that. Physician-assisted suicide. So if you go to Switzerland, if you want to die, there are other countries also which permits that, but one of the countries is that. So basically what they do is they wouldn't administer a drug onto you. They wouldn't inject onto you anything. They wouldn't even touch you. You say that you want to die, what they do is they would prescribe the drug that you could take for you to die. Now they, are, they, are, they now they have invented a particular device, a machine also. So you just get into that within a minute, you die. Happily, you die. Is what they said. I forgot the name of the, uh, the machine. Too. So now what happens is in physician-assisted suicide, they are assisting you to commit suicide without even touching on, on your body. They, they prescribe the medicines. You go out from uh, you go outside, you take that, you eat it, you die. That's physician-assisted suicide. So you see a lot of case laws associated with physician-assisted suicide abroad, which is actually not connected to active or passive euthanasia. I said that. I'm not going to discuss on right to uh, die or you know uh, Article 21 Gian Corpi. I'm not going to discuss that, but it's really really important to know something about what a particular person voluntarily wish for in the context of death as well. Say for example, there's a very 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 interesting case, uh, a final year or or rather any any even from the first year to the final year, everybody would know this particular decision. But I take so much and so much of pleasure in discussing this particular judgment, so I would say that maybe take 30 seconds, maybe I'll just take 30 or 40 seconds. Thomas Master versus Union of India. So he went to the Kerala High Court. He said, I'm a retired headmaster. It happened in 2000. And he said that I don't want to commit suicide because suicide is committed by persons who are depressed, sad, and all that. I want to voluntarily end my life. I don't want to commit suicide, but I want to voluntarily end my life. What is the meaning? I'm happy. My, 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 my sons are happy. My grandchildren are happy. I don't want to step into a phase of life where I'd be suffering from diabetes, pressure, cholesterol, and all that. I want to happily die, voluntarily commit suicide. And he also gave one of the biggest arguments before the court. The entire country is suffering from problems associated with transplantation of human organs. You're not getting the organs on time. So what I suggest is establish voluntary death clinics in the district hospitals in and around the country. Voluntary death clinic. So a person could just walk in, tell to fix the appointment to die. He could just walk in, he could die. That moment itself, he could just harvest the organs and then transplant it to the needy. That was a shocker for the judges. That was a shocker for the judges. Should I be telling the judge? No, I will not tell you the judge. But just, just understand the fact that this decision was, this, this issue was there in the year 2000. It's for all of you to kind of check what actually happened. I'll tell you a clue. They did not actually have any kind of precedence or provisions or comparative analysis to look into, comparative decisions to look into. They, they, they referred the dictionary. They referred the dictionary to know the meaning of suicide. And then they decided the matter. If you have time later, you could probably give me an answer. Otherwise, uh, let's let's see. That's just this one particular question for all of you to work upon. What, what was the end result in Thomas? Now, why should you why should you learn this particular paper? Why should anyone learn this particular paper? There is something called as autonomy. Autonomy means the patients would decide for themselves. That's autonomy. Then there's something called as beneficence. What do you mean by beneficence? Okay, you are belonging to a particular community called as Yehovah Witness. Blood transfusion is banned for your religious group. 
you meet with an accident you have been taken to hospital you have an id card saying no blood which means no blood transfusion what should the doctor do respect your autonomy or go for beneficence something that is beneficial for the patient because the patient may not know that's really really serious that the patient would die if blood transfusion doesn't take place but as a doctor you would know should you be compelling that particular patient to undergo blood transfusion as a doctor would you do that you would get the exemption that's different but the problem is there has been one particular reported case where when the particular patient was forcibly taken for blood transfusion because it was against his religion he suffered heart failure he suffered a heart attack and he died and the doctor is responsible for that because he followed beneficence not autonomy so there are problems here. there are so much and so much of cases in the united kingdom where the 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 mothers the expected mothers they say we only want c section we don't want a normal delivery doctors understand the fact that the stitches that were put earlier could actually break if she goes for a c section so the normal delivery is good for matters have gone to the courts and the judges have actually given strange judgments they have said be immediately before the delivery mothers are not in a very sound mind to decide for her of their selves so let the doctors decide how bad is the such judgments and those are the prevailing judgments even now in the united kingdom let the doctors decide for you and not you may be correct may be wrong but the interpretations have that kind of problem so there is so much to discuss here but i think i'm just i'm, I'm running short of time so basically what happens is you could either go for informed consent from the patient and then do it accordingly or if it is a real serious case the patient is unconscious and all those things you could just use the doctrine of beneficence something that is beneficial for the patient even when the patient is fully able to express his or her consent saying that i don't want to actually go for this kind of a treatment if the doctor knows that that would result in a serious harm or death the physician's duty is to kind of do that 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 their ethics teach them so there could be three possible scenarios there are a lot of case laws also associated with this the problem is judiciary could actually take any stand say for example in one case the jehovah's, uh, jehovah's witness refused the blood transfusion and uh, the judiciary said the only card that the only writing on the card that he had he had won was no blood does it actually mean no blood even in severe cases no so in severe cases the blood transfusion will be so there's a lot of you know uh, you know uh, conflicting judgments everywhere not just in the context of india everywhere and there's another question that i wanted to ask say for example a child belonging to your witness can the parents be made criminally liable if they say before the doctor that we will not allow blood transfusion on our children can the parents be held criminally responsible for causing the death of the child because they have prevented that blood transfusion so much and so much of interesting questions and i also want to ask everybody can you be compulsorily vaccinated is it really possible can you be compulsorily vaccinated there was a decision it was a very strange decision i have to show you that decision it's registrar general versus state of meghalaya 2021 by the high court there so basically what happened was for those when the lockdown was lifted partially for those persons to open their shops and commercial establishments there was a rule that was given by the commissioner saying the deputy commissioner saying that all of you should be vaccinated only then you could earn your livelihood <clears throat> so they filed a the petition saying no our right to livelihood will be affected if we say no to vaccination the court admitted the court said yes it makes sense state cannot actually tell you to be compulsorily vaccinated that is against your right to privacy but the court the, the, the court the high court failed to notice the fact that even under putta swami your right to privacy could be restricted if there is a law yes there is a law epidemic diseases act gives the power to the state government to prescribe the fact that you should be vaccinated whether there is a legitimate state aim if there is a legitimate state aim privacy could be violated compulsory vaccination what's the legitimate state aim so that the public is protected and if there is if there is proportional to the objects ought to be achieved you've got more and more covid deaths to stop the deaths you need to be vaccinated and forget about the legislation if you go for what the other jurisdictions have done czech republic wabrika versus czech republic czech republic is a country where if the children are not given those compulsory vaccines they will not be allowed to get into schooling they will not be and their parents should be paying paying an amount of fine because if they don't say you know this mass uh, you know this mass polio vaccination drive and all that right that's not just for protecting that particular vaccinated ch children that's for protecting the entire community at large 
So Czech Republic in Bavlika's case, the ECHR said nothing doing. You have to pay fine if you don't take your children for compulsory vaccinations and you will not be, your children will not be getting into a proper preschool also. But our high court seems not be really aware of all these international developments also. So compulsory vaccination, there are issues there as well. Got it. Now let's look into some other typical judgments. So just to, just to show you some other doctrines associated with this. Imagine that a particular person got stabbed four times. People rush that particular victim to the hospital. Blood transfusion should be immediately done. And the patient says, no, I belong to this particular religious community. Blood transfusion is banned for us because of which the patient dies. Can the accused be held criminally liable for causing the death? Interestingly, 1975, they had applied this kind of a rule for fixing criminal liability. Tosh's liability, this was already there. What is that? Thin skull rule, egg shell rule. Same, meaning just because the victim was fragile and not strong enough to, you know, withstand your blow or your stabbing, doesn't mean that you will not be exempted from criminal liability. Somebody hits me, I might die. You, you can see me, right? I'm very thin, I'm very lean, I'm very weak. Right, so somebody hits me, I might die. The same blow if you had given to another strong person, he would have, uh, he would have, he would have survived. But if I die, you can't just say he was just a, a person with thin skull, like he just died on a, on a simple blow of mine. You would be held criminally liable. And there is something called as doctrine of double effect, 1992 R versus Cox. Like I said before, a particular person was suffering from unbearable arthritic pain for 13 years, and the doctor he asked the doctor for ending his life. The doctor injected potassium chloride and the patient died. So there the jury said, no, the doctor is liable. Why is the doctor liable? Doctrine of double effect is not applicable to this particular doctrine, to, to the doctor. What do you mean by doctrine of double effect? Imagine the patient has asked for alleviating the pain, diluting the pain, a painkiller. But that particular painkiller would have reduced the patient's life by probably by two or three years. That is doctrine of double effect. You are doing something for good, but an evil thing would also happen as a result of that. Your pain would be reduced. That's a good thing. But you might die a couple of years before. That's a bad thing. That's a doctrine of double effect. So that is not applicable here because your primary motive is to end the particular patient's life. So I just told you two doctrines here, thin skull rule, and the other one is doctrine of double effect here. So there are there are a lot of you know uh, uh, cases uh, by which is there a question? Uh -huh. No. Okay. There are a lot of cases by which you could just understand that there have been conflicting decisions uh, uh, year after year, right? Say, for example, withholding uh, food uh, to an to, 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 uh, through a tube, through a feeding tube, that was held to be valid. Doctors have a duty to act in the best interest of their patients, but that does not actually mean that they should just keep the patient attached to an artificial system for lifelong. No. If they think that is not in the best of the particular patient to kind of continue like in a permanent state to state, then withhold or withdraw that particular system, go for passive euthanasia. But you could see this conflicting decisions every time, which is a problem. And I think one of the last areas that I will be discussing today would be death. When can you actually call a particular person dead? Okay, the law says that when he is, when his brain stem is dead, brain stem death, that's when you call that particular person dead. Now, I have a problem. You might have read it before. It's, it's from Bangalore. <clears throat> a man was, who was declared brain dead after he met with an accident got goosebumps when a doctor started his post-mortem and was admitted to the hospital. Then his vitals became normal, so now he's alive. And you should also understand the fact that his parents were actually ready to bury him. They had made all plans. They had made all plans regarding the grave or water. They had made all plans. A family member, the whole family members had actually, you know, assembled at one particular place for his funeral as well. And then this happened. Got it? It was removed from the ventilator support. Postmortem was about to be conducted. And look at what the doctor has said. Uh, There's a very interesting statement here. I forgot whether it's here or not. Yes. The doctor assigned for postmortem said that he saw cutouts announcing the particular person's death. So there were cutouts placed on the roads when he was driving to the hospital. And the doctor said, he knew the face on my surgery table because he had seen his face from the cutouts. 
but i did not expect the fact that he would be alive that's what the problem was see person has been declared as brain dead so there's some problem with regard to this and to make matters worse this is some definition of brain stem death and all that now with the to make matters worse we have got in india two definitions for death one is brain stem death under section 2d of the transplantation of human organs and tissues act of 1994 as amended in 2011 what is brain stem death when the functions of the brain stem have permanently and irreversibly ceased because you cannot connect your brain to an artificial system you can connect your heart respiratory system to an artificial system to ventilator you cannot connect your brain to that how much of neurons should die from the brain nobody has an idea nobody has an idea but if the brain has permanently and irreversibly ceased and how do you notice that you notice there is no spontaneous movement there is no response there is uh, no there's, there's, there's no breathing there brain stem reflexes that is not there if, if all these things remain like this thing for a period of 12 hours then your brain stem dead but the problem is that there is another definition for death under section 2b what is that registration of births and deaths act of 1969 says death means permanent disappearance of all evidence of life at any time after live birth has taken place the problem is if you are connected to a ventilator and your relatives could actually see the fact that your heart is actually pumping you are actually breathing they would never ever allow you to go for transplantation human organs and tissues why you are connected to a ventilator support as per 2b of the definition of death under 1969 registration of births and deaths are evidence of life is there though connected to a mechanical thing but in the case of 2d of transplantation of human organs and tissues act that condition is not there so there is a conflict between definitions of death itself in the indian context and that should be that should be resolved that should be resolved and if this would be of any help i i do not intend to take a session on transplantation of human organs act but just because it's there i would also invite your attention to this how much have we talk about transparency in transplantation of human organs like we do not have enough organs in the country to transplant so this picture says a lot on that but not much on that if you want to know the pathetic attitude of the indian courts i'm so sorry for critically analyzing everything but that's also required you might have read this particular decision before a million times from your first semester can i tell you the actual cost title of this this is the actual cost title but let me tell you the way in which they write this x versus hospital z that's the way they do it now the thing is some one particular person tested positive for hiv who was about to marry the doctors from the particular hospital conveyed this particular message that the particular person is you would be is uh, hiv positive to the bride because of which the marriage got cancelled he approached the court you know do you know what the court said the supreme court said what the doctors did it correct and they have something called as suspension of right to marry they have, it's called as suspended they have suspended the right to marry so the doctors the hospital authorities as well as the courts do have this particular right suspending a particular person's right to marry completely negating the effect of privacy but this happened in 1998 much before the case of putta swami things would have been different but we have an hiv aids act in india 2017 if i am not wrong that act specifically says there wouldn't be any kind of criminal liability or any form of liability fixed on the doctor if the doctor informs the family members of the hiv positive person because that is good for the public the doctors are given that particular explicit right right now maybe relying on 90 1990 this judgment otherwise that right is there the only exception as a married woman in all the cases may not disclose that to her husband why because she might be subjected to emotional torture or physical abuse so that exception is given but other than everybody has to uh, let know to others that they are suffering from this kind of a problem so the question here is what all should the doctor communicate to the to the to the uh, potential bride or the bride group only the hiv aids status should should that should, should importance also be communicated sterility infertility everything should be communicated so how much of health information should be kept in secrecy for that also we don't have a kind of a proper analysis being been 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 you know uh, done by the court something that i know our supreme court was not also ready to kind of pronounce a particular judgment as to whether doctors have a right to strike you know what they said the supreme court said see 2014 people for better treatment versus secretary of the ima 
they said we would only express our desire that doctors who carry out a noble service as god's agent by saving lives of people should not resort to strikes you know what they said even if we actually say doctors do not have a strike they wouldn't follow our judgment so it's better not to pronounce anything they said that explicitly they said that they said authorities medical council of india let them take a decision but but our high court was strong 2020 madras high court decided in balakrishnan versus state of tamil nadu they don't have a right to go on strike affecting the rights of patients so sometimes high court step in and and give justice much more than the supreme court i think i have got a bit more but i think i'll just stop it it's been one hour so i think i'll just wait for uh, any kind of questions or any comments or observations or any kind of i don't know anything that you want to kind of raise you may so i'll just stop sharing the slides for the time being and i'll just uh, probably wait for any kind of uh, uh, questions if there are or any kind of comments or observations like i said before <clears throat> so the basic objective was just to ensure the fact that this is also a good area for research and uh, things things become things become so perverse when you talk about uh, biomedical research guidelines stem cell research guidelines uh, when you specifically focus on laws connected to abortion because there have been several persons uh uh voluntary groups who have criticized as to why still we have uh, the registered medical practitioners opinion when it is your bodily autonomy right and all that so any any questions on the areas discussed or maybe something else also you may either write it to chat or you may just ask me those questions i would be happy to answer them if i'm aware of that you don't have to ask just for the purpose of asking questions i wouldn't be offended if you don't ask but still or if you have any comments also you may uh sir i have a question yes uh, so uh, and who is that about, uh sir who is that could you please tell me your name is uh, it ishwari Yeah. I'm sure. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So you talked about medical negligence. So right. could you tell me the parameters for us to understand that we have gone through the medical uh, negligence, or we are the victims of medical negligence? How do we normal people identify that? That's okay. That's that's a very good question. But unfortunately, the problem is it it largely that's this is one simple silly excuse that the academicians use. Uh, like you know, there are two things that we use. uh if if you're not really sure of an answer what we say is it's it's for you to research and come that's one thing that we normally say the second thing that we normally use is one particular trick by saying that we'll come to it but we'll never come to that uh, the third one is uh, it depends on the facts and circumstances of each case there are these are three basic tricks that academicians but thank you so much for the question the problem is understanding what is medical negligence understanding what is gross negligence that is still under the domain of the courts make sense so what happens is let's take one particular example the particular person should have been uh, the surgery should have been actually done to a particular right leg or amputation like cutting off the leg incident was done on the left leg so the matter goes to the court right the trial court and then the uh, the appellate court and then the highest appellate court the supreme court ultimately the supreme court decides as to whether what that particular doctor did was mere negligence or gross negligence the first step that they do was they would put this particular matter before a met the panel of doctors and that panel of doctors would actually say whether this is an established practice or not may not be applicable in the instance example that i said but say for example nurse had called a particular doctor to attend to a particular patient and the doctor did not come is it a normal practice is it a deviated practice so if the panel of doctors actually say it's not kind of obligatory on the doctors to actually be there every time when the nurses or the allied medical practitioners call them health professionals call them then that's an established practice so it's actually for the court to apply either bolam's test and then stick on to what the medical opinion has been given or they could apply the bolitos test and then say your opinion we have heard but we don't rely on your opinion because this is something that is regarding a non technical decision we would also have a say in this thing we say the doctor should have actually gone but after that stage it is the next stage is to analyze whether that is negligence or gross negligence i have been seen a case where the doctors were imprisoned after the court identifying that act to be an act of gross negligence when i saw that i got surprised and that was the newspaper clipping that i had given but but the problem is that was done by the trial court i'm pretty much sure by the time it reaches the high court the precedents that are set by the supreme court two famous cases jacob wergis and um uh, jacob matthew 
was the state of i don't forgot jacob matthew and jacob worgis case whatever yeah those two case laws are the are the precedent so as long as those things are there we're not quite sure of uh, uh, the 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 i wouldn't say parameters parameters it's clear i should say for example whether the act of a particular doctor who has been alleged to have committed negligence whether this particular act is reasonably expected of any other medical professional placed in the similar circumstance i'll give you an example i should imagine that you're a doctor you're like a very 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 exceptional excellent doctor you're like super skilled in your profession a surgeon make sense now i commit medical negligence the judges wouldn't ask you the judges wouldn't ask your opinion because you're super skilled in that we don't want highly skilled professional that is what bolan said similarly placed people ordinary skill ordinary skill that ordinary meaning meaning ordinary skilled in medical profession not ordinary man not a man on a clay pam omnibus meaning a reasonable man that you see here and there no as reasonably similarly placed skilled professional you ask them and they say this is also an accepted procedure while doing this thing it's fine say for example if you do something on your nose tracks and all those things so i'm not really sure about the medical terms there's one particular medical procedure where you clip a particular part so that the the blood doesn't ooze into the lungs got it one of the case was that we discussed i think it was jacob matthew's case blood oozed into the lungs of a particular person and he died and the medical panel they said that this is also an accepted practice not putting that particular clip in every time you cannot expect blood to ooze into the lungs maybe true but the patient has lost his life only medical negligence and not gross negligence so the parameter is that but the parameter may not be accepted by everybody may not by me for sure that's a problem got it aishwarya does that make any sense to you uh, yes sir great kannan uh, p ha, ha, uh, hi uh, yeah don't call me sir sandeep sandeep is my name i feel that there should be need for much protection for the doctors okay uh, especially when there is an attack on the doctors right when patient is dead and relatives uh what could be work safety provided from the law as immediate remedy on avoiding the issue in future thank you so much for that question kanan now that's kind of okay that's kind of literally all but i'll tell you yeah kanan if you're still there and have you heard about the epidemic diseases act yeah right so as of now as of now very recently last year the epidemic diseases act was uh, amended only because of the incidents the infamous bad incidents that happened during the pandemic where medical professionals were attacked so an explicit provision is there epidemic disease is a very short legislation otherwise even now also basically giving powers to the state government to take some extra measures right anything that they could do emergency measure which that, that could be anything now the problem is yeah the, the, the good thing is they have amended that particular epidemic disease act and right now as of now that particular clause specifically prevents by ensuring criminal liability on uh, 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 ensuring criminal liability on the person who attack the medical professional so just similar to the ipc ipc doesn't ask you not to commit murder or not to commit culpable homicide it says if you commit you will be booked so we have a specific provision under the epidemic diseases act uh, let me just check whether it's there in my slide itself maybe in another slide please just give me like 2 minutes uh, i can do that because i just kind of what i basically did was i just called out a few portions from uh, the slide that i had uh, should be having it just a second just a second it's it wouldn't be that difficult um, maybe it's difficult now. okay i have the epidemic diseases act with me um it is okay 2b i'll just copy that um uh, i'm going to type it in the chat box content so that um you will receive it i think i've sent that to everyone so you should be receiving it this is the amendment um that was in 2020 and this this penalty also after that it's basically cognizable and uh, non deductible this is the penalty that's there so the, the amendment has kind of taken um yeah th thanks kanan yeah so the amendment is uh, taken care of that but 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 there's a problem like people uh, who, who teaches you labor law uh, probably there's also one particular question that you could put forward to that particular academician uh, basically asking whether the occupational safety act that is actually pending whether that is also applicable to health professionals because it's really 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 required uh, for the act to be applicable to them also we never know whether it's applicable or not people say it's applicable because there's not been any exception that's given but medical professionals are a bit skeptic 
they are a bit skeptic. They think that that may not be applicable for some unknown reason. So it's always good to kind of get that clarity also in addition to this. I wouldn't say this itself is sufficient. So occupational safety, that is also required. Thank you so much.